Okay, folks, thanks to everyone joining us today. We're super excited because with us today, we have Trina Martin. And first of all, I want to thank her for her many years of service to our country. So thank you, Trina. We're really blessed to have folks like you watching over us every day. So thank you so much. And just to give you a little bit of background, and then I'm going to let Trina fill in the blanks. Um, she is an author, an inspirational speaker, and a personal development coach who inspires emerging leaders to pursue their wildest dreams with heart and grit. She is also an accomplished and dedicated member of the U.S. military for nearly 30 years. Right, Trina? Almost yes. 30 years. And you've broken barriers and made strides in your career that many said weren't possible. And you also have a stellar 20-year career in the IT field, right, Trina? That's correct. So you're a very accomplished young lady. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so obviously we're here to talk about your book, but I want to dig in a lot deeper to what it is that you do for folks to help them. You've been through trials and tribulations in your life. You've obviously learned a lot from them as well as what you learned in the military. So today I want to, you know, quickly go over um, maybe some points that I left out about your career and who you are and what brought you here. And then we'll dig into the rest. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. Oh, well, thank you, Caroline, for having me. And thank you for your support of me and all the other people who serve this great country. Um, so just to give you some additional information about me. Um, I was born in Chicago. I'm the number four of four children. And um, as you said, I've been in the military for 30 years. It'll be 30 years this May. I was the first in my family to go to college. Uh, I self-financed that. And I got a degree in computer science. So I worked in IT for 20 years as a computer programmer. I wrote programs and I maintained multi-million dollar systems for major corporations. Um, I've traveled the world. I've I've had great successes in my career and professionally, um, but personally, I struggled with low self-esteem and not knowing my worth. Um, see, because my mother was verbally abusive to me, and every word that she spoke to me was like a punch in the face. With each word, she tore my confidence, and I I shrank and I began to feel just worthless. So just growing up, you know, she would tell me how ugly I was and how I wasn't a good daughter. So you can imagine how that plays on a person's self-esteem. And she she just wasn't loving or supportive. So because of that childhood, I grew up and I became a type A person, very driven to succeed because I wanted love and appreciation from someone else, validation. I became a pleaser, hoping to get that in return. So it's taken me many, many years to be the woman that you see sitting before you today that's confident, who loves herself, and who is whole. So I sat back, and as I've done my growth and personal development, I realized that my life, I was created to use that life to help other people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing now because I went through everything that I went through and I didn't have any support. I didn't know who to go to, who to talk to. And thinking back, I'm going, you know what? I'm not the only person who's ever gone through that. Mm -hmm. And if I can take what I've gone through to help someone else better their lives and to get their confidence and self-esteem back before they get to the point where I was, that's what I want to do. My life could have taken a very different path. We both know that sometimes people who grew up in um, adverse situations, they don't take the road of let's be successful and strive. Sometimes they take it as, okay, this is my lot in life. I can't do any better. And they go the 360 route. I just happen to take that and turn it into being a driven, hardworking person who just wanted to succeed all the time. So that's my mission. My mission is to help other people who are going through similar things and who think that because of that or because of past mistakes that they made, that they're worthless, that they don't have anything worth to go forward, that they think that they're not good enough or they've been listening to what, 
you know, someone has said about them, about them not being smart enough or, you know, pretty or whatever that case may be that has torn their, their self-esteem down. I want to be that person who builds them back up so that they can go on and know that they were created to have an amazing life. That's wonderful. And, um, I, you know, I'm really very impressed that you were able to not only pull yourself away from all of that abuse, that verbal abuse, because you did experience some of that in a marriage too, correct? Yes. yes. Right. We can get into that. But, and then, and then I want to talk about like the patterns that led you to like follow people in your, or marry people in your life that were abusive. But let's talk about your book a little bit. So it's called From a Mess to Amazing, Seven Steps to create the life that you deserve. So these seven steps, um, what was the revelation that you said one day, you know, I did these things to get me from point A to point B, and I know that they can help other people. Like what took you there? Oh, so many things. Like I said, I had always been driven because of my mother, but it wasn't until later on in life that I kind of, step back and started doing some inward reflecting because like you said there's patterns so i i was getting to the same pattern with men i found myself going you know i'm this good person why am i ending up with these type of men mm. um so i had to take a step back and really evaluate myself and found out that it all stemmed from my childhood and then i just decided i said you know what i don't want to live my life like this I don't want to have children and I don't want to repeat that cycle because, you know, there, if you're not careful, you'll be in a generational cycle where you've passed it on and then it's gone to the next next generation and next. And I didn't want to do that. And I only I kept reflecting back to how not only was my mother verbally abusive, she was very negative. Everything it were, everything was, oh, woe well, is me. You know, this person is there and I can't get here. And I just I said, nope, I don't want to do that. So she played the victim card. Too. Yes. Yes. So I didn't I didn't want to do that. And I wanted to change my life. And it, it took years and just getting past all of that. You know, I, I went through a part of, you know, having depression. I went through not thinking I was good enough, even though I had all the success professionally. Personally, I was a mess on the inside. You know, I just you know, I was picking the wrong men to be in relationships with, again, trying to be validated, thinking that, oh, well, they're going to see the kind of person that I am, and they're going to love me, and they're going to, you know, be there for me. Well, it wasn't like that. I was that person. I was giving that, but I wasn't getting that in return. And of course, people can see the type of person you are. So instead of them giving me the love and support that I was seeking, it was more let me verbally abusive, let me, you know, verbally abuse you, let me get, um, one guy even got physical with me and I ended up getting out um, before it got um, oh, bad. I, mm. um, so that was kind of like my wake up call just through the years. You know, I think once I hit almost 40, I said, okay, what what is my life going to be like i can't blame anybody there's no excuses i am the victim of my own choices so what do i want these choices to be and so that's when i decided that i'm invested in myself to get myself better mentally so that i can keep myself in a right frame of mind so i'm not thinking that you know i'm living in lack and scarcity I didn't want to have that mindset. So that's what drove me to write the book and put all of these things in there that I learned on my journey. In your book, you talk about courage and the importance of finding courage to change because it really does involve a lot of courage to be able to take the steps that you did. How do you recommend that to someone? Uh, you, because you can't just tell someone to be courageous. Right. How do they find the courage deep within to even buy your book and say, well, let me see what these seven steps are and maybe they can help me. Where does a person begin? Mm -hmm. Good question. So where some where I would suggest a person <coughs> begins is, again, self-reflecting. Nothing's going to get better unless you want it to get better. So everything starts with your mindset, mm -hmm. just like me. I wasn't going to get better until I actually looked at myself and said, okay, I have these issues here and this is what I want to change about myself. 
So when I say the courage to change, that's what I mean. I know um, when we say courage, sometimes we think about, you know, strong, brave, you know, that type of thing. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you looking within yourself, realizing that there's areas of your life, whatever they may be, that you want to change. And then you decide whatever it takes that that's what you're going to do, regardless of what someone may think. It's not about anyone else. It's about you and what you want for your life. So that's what I mean when I say the courage. And picking up the book is a first step of saying, okay, and, and I'm not saying that that book is going to cure your life, but right. if you, you know, get the book and you're saying, okay, here's seven steps. Let me build upon them for what I need to do. That's what I wanted to do. That's the kind of the foundation I wanted to present. Let's talk about verbal abuse a little bit. Um, you suffered terribly through mm -hmm. episodes of verbal abuse in your life. At what point did you realize that you were being ver verbally abused? Were you in your teens? Were you younger than that? And like, when did you realize, hey, this is as bad as being punched in the face? You know, I realized that at a very early age because um, my mother was just, she, it was, it wasn't, I don't even know how to explain it because it was like the things that she would say would just come from like the depths of her bowel. You would go like, wow, did you really say that to me? And I remember growing up how I wasn't allowed to have friends. And, you know, this was the day of having, you know, a landline, the house phone with the long cord and someone called the house. She would get on the line because you could, you know, talk through the line and she would just be as mean as she could. Get off the phone. Get off my phone. So pretty soon people didn't want to talk to me. They didn't want to be my friends because they said, you have a mean mom. And after hearing that for a while and after seeing that I couldn't foster relationships, I started to realize this is not normal. This is not normal for a parent to treat their child this way. And I just remember growing up thinking, OK, my strategy is I'm going to go to high school. I'm going to graduate and I'm going to go to college and I'm never coming back here. Well, at what age did you discover that? Like, at what age did you have this revelation? Oh, my God. It, you know, I think I was as young as maybe seven or eight. I was fairly young. Yeah, that's how that's how deep it goes. Um, and like I said, all my life, I, I actually st go, would go in and out of some of the things that she would say. And I would just get so angry and I was so hurt because... I would go, you know, I can't, I can't believe she said these things. You know, if if she wasn't this type of person, maybe I would have had more self-worth and then I wouldn't have tried to get it from this type of man. Um, but yeah, it was very early. I, I realized that this was not a normal, normal. household. Yeah. Wow. Um, because verbal abuse is, is kind of like pushed back in the mental health arena. It's not really recognized the way that it should be. I think now more than ever, like I'm seeing articles about verbal abuse and people are talking about it more, mm -hmm. but I think it's so prevalent that it's almost camouflaged. Like people just don't want to discuss it or maybe it happens so much to so many people that they just don't want to acknowledge that. I don't, I could never rightfully understand why other mental illnesses, mm -hmm. attraction and verbal abuse doesn't seem, what are your thoughts on that? You know what I think, and I've been thinking about this for years. I think it's the fact that it's verbal. I think people equate the horribleness of physical abu abuse um, because it's something that you can see. Right. Verbal abuse, you can't see it. But when you're verbally abusive to someone, that's that can't go away. That's not like a scar that heals and eventually goes away. That stays in that person's psyche and in their mind and in their being forever. Just like I said, now I can recall some of the stuff my mother said to me like it was yesterday and I'm almost 50 years old. Um, so I think people view them differently. And I'm not saying that physical abuse is not horrible, but it's abuse, verbal abuse is abuse, you know, the same, but I think one you can see, one you can't. So the one that you can't, I don't think people really pay attention to it. Mm. It's almost like an invisible bully. Yes. You know, it's really weird. 
Um, and, and so many people are verbally abused. Yes. Whether it's through a spouse, parent, friends, mm-hmm. sisters, brothers. I mean, it's just incredible to think about. I mean, I've experienced some in my life too. So of course, and I think so many people have, that's one of the things that touched me to really want to speak to you because I think this is something that needs to be talked about and there is a way out. And I, I love the way you found your way out and I love the life that you live and how you transformed your life. Um, so it's, it's just so heartwarming and touching to see that you transformed your life. One of the things you used, the tools you used, were called SMART goals. Mm-hmm. Now, we hear about them, like when I worked in corporate America, that was the buzzword that was thrown around. But yet, a lot of people don't really know what SMART goals are. Could you cover them for us and let us know why they're so important and how they worked for you? Yes. So SMART goals are, it's it's an acronym. So it stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. I think I say time frame in the book. So basically how it helped me is, and we've all heard the saying that, um, you know, unless you actually put something in action, it's just a dream. Mm -hmm. So a goal is actually putting work in to attain something tangible, whatever that goal is. And for me, how I use it is pen to paper. I can think something, but until I write it down, it doesn't seem to stick. Um, And it's just something about writing, I guess, just to get it out. And I guess that's why journaling, a lot of people like to journal. Yes. But a goal, you have to be specific with a goal. It's just like saying, I want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. We all want to lose weight, right? So, okay, so what do you want to lose? Well, I want to lose 100 pounds. Okay, great. Well, how are you going to lose that 100 pounds? Well, you know, I'm going to stop eating. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do all of these things. Okay, well, you're not going to lose 100 pounds today. So how are you planning on on doing that? Mm-hmm. So this is where your, you know, attainable and realistic comes in. So if I say, you know what, I want to lose 10 pounds in a year. That's attainable. Right. That's realistic. But if I say, you know what, I want to lose 75 pounds in six months, not so much. So that's where the smart goals you know, come in at, you want something that one is specific. You want a way that you can measure it because you want to check in and see how you're doing. Right. Because, you know, when I make my list of things I have to do, I put a little box and as I complete something, I put my checkbox in. So I know, okay, I've done this task. I know that I've done that task. Then of course you want to know, okay, you want a goal that's set high enough that you're, you're looking and you're trying to move yourself forward, but you don't want it so high where you get discouraged and you're going, you know what, you know, it's month six and I'm just at five pounds. I want to lose 75 pounds. Then you're going to stop because you're going to think it's impossible. It's not impossible. You just didn't have an attainable, realistic goal. Um, So you have that. And then also putting the time to it. So it's not just, okay, I want to lose 75 pounds. Well, when do you want to lose that 75 pounds? Okay, I want to lose it by, you know, December 31st, 2020. That is giving yourself a time frame. So as you're doing the steps, as you're checking in and you're measuring your results and you're seeing how you're doing throughout the year, mm-hmm. you know, okay, it's it's February 1st, let's say, and I have another 10 months to go. So I know, okay, I, I'm on track to lose X amount of pounds. So this is what I need to continue to do. And that's the basis of the SMART goal. It's just a way for you to have in your mind to stay focused on what you need to do. So you're giving yourself realistic uh, goals to achieve and you're giving yourself the proper amount of time to achieve them rather than overwhelm yourself with unrealistic expectations. Exactly. That's brilliant. brilliant. I really like that a lot. Um, It's good to know for folks to know that these things take time you know you can't lose 10 pounds in a day it takes months or a few months to do it so excellent excellent um you also said that personal development requires self-awareness 
Now, when you say the word self-awareness to a lot of folks, they get lost in like a sea of self-help terminology. <laughs> what exactly is self-awareness to you? To me, self-awareness is knowing who you are. Okay, not who, not your title, not who other people have said you are. You know, some people, you meet people, you go, you know, hi, I'm Trina, nice to meet you. And you go, hi, I'm Carol Ann, I'm XYZ, blah, 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 and I work for company, blah, blah. Well, that's not who you are. Right. You know, so getting to know who you are and what you want out of life, what makes you tick, what you like, what you don't like, what, you know, what are your boundaries that you have for yourself in life? That's what I mean by being self-aware. Just knowing you as a person, you at your core, who are you? And when you discovered this self-awareness, did you immediately say at that point, okay, I, I know what I want and I have to figure out how to get there and therapy, you know, talking to someone was part of that process I read, correct? In your yes. Process. How important did you feel that that therapeutic process was in your self-awareness discovery? It was very, very vital. I mean, because I had a lot going on in my head, a lot. And there was a time where, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone to a therapist, but I was like, you know, I, I really do need to get some things out. And let's like just I said, pause. So, so at some point in your life, Therapy was off the table for you. You know, it just wasn't something that I would have thought of naturally. Now I, you know, I'm like, oh, you know what? I need to go talk to someone. You know, right, if, right. If, you know, if it's every couple of months, I'm like, yeah, that just makes me feel better. I'll do it. But I remember, you know, let's say 20 years ago, I would have been like, oh, I'm not crazy. I'm fine. Oh, right. You know, because that's how that's how we thought it was. If you went yes. to a therapist, it was like, oh, you're crazy. Right. You know, and there's nothing wrong with checking your mental health and it's funny because we take care of everything on our body but we don't take care of our mind so true you know if you know if you have an ingrown toenail you go to a podiatrist you get that taken care of you know you have you know high blood pressure diabetes we get that taken care of but if you're struggling you know with anxiety or depression somehow we feel shame to get that taken care of so for me it was vital i, I really did need to sit and talk to someone and start to thinking and start to really coming into who I was and not letting my past keep coming into my future. And that's where I wanted to make the change. I didn't want to, you know, my mother has since um, died, but I didn't want to continue to validate her right. by the things that I was suffering from, the, the mental trauma. Because I was like, what? I'm giving her life. Even though she had mm. passed on, I was giving her life by just continuing to live in that. Mm. You know, and it's funny, and, and I'll tell you the story. So I have a brother. I have two brothers, but my eldest brother I'm very close to. And after I got divorced, I was talking to him about my ex and how he didn't want to help support the children, blah, blah, blah. And he sat and listened to me, and I went through the whole shebang. And finally, after I finished, he said... You know what? I said, what? He said, you sound like mom. He said, you sound very bitter. That must have cut deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah. And after that, I said, oh, yeah, I'm done. Because when he said that, yeah, it was like, it was like he had stabbed me in my heart because that's the last thing that I would want somebody to tell me is I sounded like my mom. Um, so I said, okay, I need to get some help. I need to get over this and I need to just go on about my way and, and better myself and my life and be better for my children. And that's what I did. And, you know, my ex is still my ex. We've gotten better in some ways, but in, you know, most of the ways he's still the same, but it doesn't bother me anymore. Right. You know, it used to bother me. I would be like, oh, oh, why is he like this? Ooh. Now I'm just like, hmm, whatever. Yeah. You know, I don't even give it a time of day, you know, because my peace of mind and my happiness is more important than that. And that's where I'm at right now in my life that I'm not going to let anybody devalue me or take my peace in my life. And that's the state that I always want to be. Right. In. I think too, plus you realize that other people's behavior is on them. Yes. It's not on you. 
Yes. You have no control over how other people behave. And I think that's a big like revelation to have. Now you had another moment in your life too that was, you know, full of revelation where I think a senior officer said something to you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Yes, he actually, he wasn't an officer. So I was enlisted for 14 years before I got my commission. So this guy was a good friend of mine and we were both enlisted at the time, but he outranked me oh. and we were on, we were on active duty and, um, and, you know, I was just, you know, and again, my childhood, you know, I'm quick to respond and react because that's the type of mother I had. And that's how I had to defend myself with her. And uh, one day we were working and, you know, I was doing what I do. And, you know, at one moment we, we were just pausing and he said, you know, I'm going to tell you something. He said, I'm telling you because I'm your friend. He said, you know, honestly, I don't care whether you like it or not. Maybe you want to be my friend after. I don't care. But he said, you know, you want to be an officer, right? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you'll never make it. He said, the way you act, he said, you know, the Navy is looking for people who are calm, who knows how to handle situations, who are not reactionary. He's like, you react, you're quick, you know, things, you know, get you flared up, you know, quickly. He said, you can't be that type of person and be an officer. And again, that was another one of those, you know, knife moments, right? I was like, <clears throat> I was like, and I was mad at him for a quick second. But then again, I looked at myself and I said, he's right. So again, going back to your earlier question about self-awareness, that's part of it too, knowing when you're wrong, knowing where you need to improve. Yeah. Um, because I know a lot of people think, well, I'm, I'm right, everybody else is wrong, that's their fault. Well, no, the common denominator in the equation is you. So you need to look at yourself. So when he said that, that again made me take a step back and really say, okay, let me work on myself. Mm -hmm. And and I did, and hence I became an officer. But he was right. If I continued to do the things that I was doing and being the person that I was then, I would have never made it. Well, that's very commendable, too, because a lot of folks would take a comment like that from someone and just let, let themselves be angry over it and not look at it as a moment for self-reflection and change. And you did. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it was, yeah, it was tough. You know, it's, it's tough yeah. when you have, you know, a friend tell you that, but I knew he was doing it out of love. You know, I, I knew he didn't have any ill will to do it. He had nothing to gain or lose by telling me that. He was trying that. to help you. I mean, right. Right. Yeah. 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 He was trying to help me. Now you talk about choosing the right people. Mm -hmm. um, why is it that people that are abused, whether it's verbally, physically, why do they always choose like people? <laughs> Why do you think that is? Is it comfortable? What's your explanation of that? You know, I don't think it's comfortable. From my experience, I think it's the fact that, so for me, I think I chose these same type of people because they spotted me. So it's like a predator and a prey, right? Mm -hmm. They would look and they knew my deficiencies and they knew how to play on that and knew that, I was weak and that I didn't know my worth so that I would fall into their trap. I was easy wow. prey. So I think that was more of it. And me not knowing my worth and that thinking that I could do better, I would go, okay, okay, well, they're treating me bad now, but they're going to see that, you know, I'm, I'm a good person, so they're going to change. And it never, you know, no one changes. You can't change anyone. But there are people out there who prey on other people. Mm -hmm. And if you're weak in any aspect, they they hone in on that and that's i think that was my problem um as far as the situations that i you know had you know found myself in mm -hmm. um so yeah i think it's just that you end up being easy prey to people and they know how to you know because it, it, they always started out for me it, well, they always started out nice they would tell me the things like oh yeah i love you you're such a great person Oh, yeah, I will, you know, I would treat you like this. Oh, I really appreciate And so I'm going, oh, yeah, finally, somebody who, who's going to love me, somebody who's going to appreciate me and support me. Well, yeah, it, no, it wasn't that. It was just that, you know, I was their easy, you know, prey. And then once they sucked me in, it was, okay, now here, let me pounce on you. At what point did, did you realize this has to stop, like, attracting these type of people? 
And what did you do to stop it? Did you just not like develop any relationships for a while until you sorted it through? What was your process? You know, it's it's funny you say that. So after I divorced my ex, which is the father of my children, um, I I took a long look and I realized, I said, you know, I really didn't want to marry him, but I did, again, doing the settling thing, thinking, well, okay, um, you know, I don't think anybody else is better going to come along. So he's here and okay, I'll do it. And he even had a good friend of his that tried to tell me not to marry him because he's ah. like, you're so much better than him. Um, but I did. And, you know, I have two wonderful children, you know, as a result. But after that, I sat and I said, you know what? I married somebody who I didn't even want to marry, who I knew was not what I was looking for. So then I said, you know what? Let me start working on me because this is a pattern with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why am I doing this? I'm like, why am I settling? And that's what I was doing. I said, why am I settling? I don't have to settle. You know, I, I think I'm a worthy enough person to not settle. And I have a good friend of mine. I think I mentioned this in the book. Um, we've been friends for almost 30 years. So she has seen the ups and the downs and everything. And um, I remember her always saying, you know, know your worth. Yes. Know your worth. And, and it really didn't dawn on me what she was saying until this moment. And I said... Wow, she's right. You know, because she would say, you know, you're a good person. You're a good. Heart. You know your worth. Stop, you know, stop settling. Mm. And I thought, she's right. I don't have to settle. If I can't find or there's no one who is on the level that I'm looking for, then I'd rather not be with anyone. And I've been divorced now for almost 10 years mm. because of that. Because I'm like, you know what? I don't have time for settling and I just won't settle I'm like you know I'm at the point in my life that if someone else comes into my life I want to be happy you know I want to be happy I want to have peace I want to be loved and I just don't feel the need to settle anymore you also talk about forgiveness and I think that's a big one so two-part question did you ever come to a place where you forgave your mom and found that inner peace and how do you forgive yourself for past aggressions? You know, because we we have to take some responsibility for it as well. So how did you manage to deal with those two things? So um, so that's that's pretty difficult because my mom, you know, who passed in 2006, she's, you know, I was from Chicago, so she lived in Chicago and I went home for the funeral and to get all her affairs and things like that in order and we were at the funeral home you know after they prepped her and they had us to come in and view and I just had a breakdown I just fell on the floor crying and and which was shocking to me because I was like why am I crying but why you know um but I think it wasn't so much I was crying because of the hurt I was angry yes I was so angry and I remember I didn't verbalize it, but I remember saying in my head some not so nice things, but I was angry because I was like, she died and never once said she was sorry. Mm. You know, she died and not once said she loved me. So I think it was more anger than anything. It wasn't the fact that I was, oh my God, I'm so hurt. This is my mother and I'm devastated. It was, I was angry. I was angry at her for doing the things she did to me and leaving me in the mental state that I was. And she never once apologized. She never once acknowledged it. So after that, and just, and I was still married at the time and just the course of events that I went through after that, I just said, you know what? This is really taking a toll on me. It's taking a toll on me and my mental health. And talking to some other people and one other friend, her mother passed and she said, well, you know, she said, Trina, I think your mom did the best she knew how to do. I was like, well, you know what? I don't think that was the best she knew how to do because I would see her treat outsiders, you know, great, you know, but she would treat me horribly. So it wasn't like she didn't know how to do. Did she though. treat your other siblings like that, too, or did you get the brunt of it? I got the brunt of it because being the youngest of four, I had the largest age gap. So by the time I was into my 
teens, 12, 13 years old, all of my siblings were out of the house wow. doing, you know, having their own life. And I think the result of this was just, she was just a, a better woman mm. just within herself and angry at herself. So she took it out on me. I was the person um, left in the house with her alone. And I have recently realized that I had a niece that ended up being raised by my mother. She got it even worse than I got it. Oh. And I didn't know this until my niece reached out to me a, a few months ago an email and we started talking and she said, oh, we always thought you were the golden child. And I said, huh, no, let me tell you. And she was like, oh my God. She was like, and these are the things that I went through. And I told her, I said, you know what? I believe you. Yeah. I totally believe you. Um, so when I realized and, and getting back to the question as far as forgiveness, it took me getting back into my faith and getting back spiritual to realize that, okay, I need to forgive her, not for her, but for myself. Right, right. You know, because when you don't forgive someone for the wrong that they've done you, it's not doing anything to you, to them. It's the, it's hurting you. You know, it's like you drinking poison and you thinking the other person's going to die. Right, right. So I realized that and I said, you know what? Okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to forgive her. You know, she's gone and whatever and she did it and I, I need to move on I needed to move on for my mental health and mm -hmm. for my sanity and for me to move on in life without becoming her which is being a better person I never want to be the person sitting back going hey, yeah you know my life is this way and my life is that way so I had to release that sure so once I released her I had to think about myself because of course I had beat myself up all these years because I was like, oh my God, why am I so stupid? Why did I marry that guy? Why did I date this guy? How did I end up in this relationship? It, it, so all of these things on top of that. And then finally, I again, just pouring into my faith and getting back there, I realized that, okay, I'm human. I did these things. I made mistakes, but those mistakes don't define me. So because I chose the wrong person or I've made some poor choices or mistakes in life. That doesn't mean that I'm a bad person. Right. So I had to really, really work on myself and come to understand that and know that. Do and you that, find you're still forgiving yourself? Like, is it I, a process? It's a process. It's, you know, and certain times I'll, I'll kind of revert back of, oh my God, why did, and I have to remember, you know, you're human. You made a mistake. Don't do this, you know, don't make the same mistake. Keep moving forward because we all do. We tell ourselves at one time and oh, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. Why did you do that? You know, right. you know, you, you know better. And I, you know, I had it really bad because I was going, here I am. I'm a smart person. I get these degrees. I've done this. And I've done that. How can you be so stupid to do this? And yeah, I had to just, I had to forgive myself. And she said, you know what? I, I did things out of you know, thinking someone was going to love me. Um, I've made poor choices. I've made mistakes. But me at my core and who I am, that's not who I am. And it's not going to make me feel that I'm less than. And it's funny because probably about five years ago, I ended up dating this guy. And every chance he got, he was just trying to tear me down he would say some of the the nastiest things to me you know it, it was funny because you know i was we you know, i thought okay we're you know we're dating so i'm being transparent we're talking and sharing stories and i'm like well yeah you know i understand that i've made xyz mistake blah 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 and he act like he was the judge you know you did that and blah 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 and you're so stupid blah 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 and i'm like wow. you know he, and he would get very verbally nasty with me and I one day I asked him I said why do you care why do you care what I did you know I didn't even know you then you were you know why do you care about my mistakes I hope that you I made? ran fast from hell oh, yes. yes I did and I was like why do you care and again a verbally abuse, abusive person and then I after I started you know really looking into him he had done some things that on my scale were totally immoral yeah. and you know and I was going wow <laughs> here's well, that's him projecting 
Exactly. To you. That's exactly what he was doing. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so I had to get past, you know, I had to forgive and then I had to forgive myself. And I think oftentimes we don't forgive ourselves enough. I think it's easier to forgive someone else and not forgive ourselves. That's and, such a good point. Yeah. And I think that's something that we all need to work a little harder at mm-hmm. is saying, OK, yeah, OK, I, I did something dumb, but that doesn't mean I'm a dumb person. So of your seven steps, what do you think is the most important for folks to say, okay, there are seven things she's recommending I do, but I really need to focus on this particular one. Number one, which is mindset. Because for me, until you get your mind right, you can't do anything. Mm. That's the most important thing. So, I mean, it's, it's just like saying, you know, hey, I'm getting up and going to the gym. Well, if you're still in the mindset of sitting and drinking, you know, Coke and eating ice cream. Right. You know, it doesn't work too well, right, you know. Right, right. So, <laughs> so, so, so the mindset, I, I would say with anything, whether you're trying to improve your personal life or if you're trying to improve, you know, improve your professional life, whatever, it all starts up here. So I think the mindset is very, very important. And. The, what do you recommend a person do first? So, you know, here's a person that wants to change. They, you know, they want to follow your advice. Okay, so it's mindset. What should I do? Go to a therapist first? Should I start journaling? Like, what do you recommend a person do first? You know what I would do? I would sit down and recommend that they sit down and just get a piece of paper and say, okay, who am I today? Mm-hmm. Who am I today? Who do I want to be or who do I know I can be? And then from there, look at that and say, okay, this is what I need to do to get to this place. So if, you know, if you got like me, if you have some things that's going on in your life or in your past that maybe you need to talk out, go to a counselor. Um, Just the different avenues. But until you really sit down, because just saying, okay, I'm changing my mindset. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you changing your mindset for? Right. What are you going to do? So I think you need to really sit back and think about it. Because some people think they're perfect. Some people are like, oh, it's nothing wrong with me. Right. You know, and usually those are people who are are most screwed up, the ones who don't think anything's wrong with them. Um, But I think if you write a piece of paper and say, okay, you know what? I'm unhappy here. You know, these are the things that make me unhappy. These are the things that make me happy. And this is where I want to be. You know, whether it's a career change, where there's a life change, uh, maybe you're in a relationship that you know you shouldn't be in. That's a mindset. That's your mind. You need to say, okay, this is a relationship I shouldn't be in, so I need to be working to get out of it. So do some self-reflecting and see what areas, you know, really need the most change. Now, uh, what services do you offer folks, if any, or is it just your book in terms of offering help and advice to other people. Tell us what, you know, if anything you do to help folks. Now I do have one-on-one coaching um, services for personal development and leadership. Cause I do both of those. And what are they like, what are those per- coaching services like? Well, it depends on what you are. So like my executive um, coaching, which is, I call it, it's my one-on-one, but I call it executive. It's eight weeks of with me. So yes, it's eight weeks. So once a week, I'm going to check in on Zoom with you. We're going to talk. You're going to, you know, see where you're going. We're going to say where you want to go. And every week I'm going to check in with you and we're going to discuss what's going on in your life. Where are you going with the things you need to do? How are you making your progress? Um, Well, I have that. Um, I do group coaching. So if It's a company out and, you know, a company like, okay, I need you to come out to do leadership training. I'll do that. Um, I'm actually developing a course right now that's going to be an online six-week course that's, I'm calling it the Intentional Life Blueprint, because I think without intention, you can't do anything in life. So you have to have the mindset, and then you have to set intention. Every day, there has to be be an intention for your life, because if not, life kind of runs you, you know, you get the people who, you know, don't know who they are, where they're going, because I just woke up this morning and however it goes, it goes. You need to have intention. You need to say, okay, 
today is this day and I want to get XYZ accomplished and this is how I'm going to go about doing it. And this is an online course folks can take? Yes, I'm I'm creating it now. It should be done really soon where I'm going to have that online. But executive coaching and if, if the, um, the viewers want to go to my website and set up a free consultation call so that we can see whether we're a good fit to work with each other, they can do that as well. So you would do an assessment of the person's situation and then take it from there. Yes. Oh, very good. Yes. That's wonderful. So in closing, do you have any other advice that you would um, like to to share with our listeners? Something important that maybe we didn't touch on? Um, just, you know, I, I would like to leave with one quote. And this is my favorite quote, and it's by Nelson Mandela. And the quote is, it always seems impossible until it's done. Mm. So I just want to leave you with that takeaway. Just think about the things that you want in life, what you're striving for, what you're trying to get. I mean, even if you're trying to forget and lay down your past and move to a, a, a more abundant future, it seems impossible, but it's not. It just requires you to keep striving. Exactly. Sometimes we need to change direction a little bit, but that's okay too, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, can folks reach out to you uh, through an email that maybe we can run across the screen as well um, if they have any questions or want to set up a counseling with you? What would your yes. email be? So my email is nextlevel at trinamartin.com. Okay, and I'll obviously run that across as mm -hmm. well. And, of course, go to trinamartin.com for your book so they mm -hmm. can purchase your book. It's available on Amazon as well. Yes. And we'll have all those links for folks to uh, be able to. Your book was great. Thank you. Um, one of the reasons I liked it is because it, was, it, it had a great flow. Okay. So it kind of took you to, you know, from different levels to, mm -hmm. to where you got to and how folks can get there as well. And it lets you see inside of, like, your mind and personality, mm -hmm. too, so folks can relate to um, a lot of the situation that you went through and how you got out of it. So it was it was really a great read. Thank you so much for writing that. I know it's definitely going to help some folks out. And that, that was my goal. I really wanted to impact other people. And I, I was vulnerable in that book and shared things that I had never shared with, you know, anyone except for one or two close people because... It was important to me that people saw what was real. Yes. I didn't want to seem like I was some, you know, person on high giving them theory. I wanted them to see that, no, this is real life and this is what I actually went through and this is how I overcame it. So if one person is impacted by that to change their life, I've I've done my job. Oh, yes, I'm sure a lot of folks are going to, you know, benefit from that because people don't want complicated you know, right. people want easy things they can follow. They don't need complicated when they already are living complicated. Exactly. And that's and that's really what I wanted. I wanted it to be an easy read and, and, and it's not long, so it's not like a three hundred page book. Right. Um, because who has time for that? Exactly. You know, honestly, I mean I don't have time for that. I mean I get some books by some of my favorite authors and when I look at them I'm like, Oh, they're three hundred pages. I don't know, you know, when I'm gonna read this. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to to be easy, an easy read for people, but yet I wanted them to read it and say, Oh my God, yeah, I've had something similar like that to happen to me. Oh, I know exactly what she's talking about. Right. Right. That's what I wanted. Yeah, because empathy goes a long way. Yes. It really does. It goes a long yes. way. Thank you so much, Trina. It was Thank wonderful you. speaking with you. Thank you, Carolyn. I really appreciate it, and thank you for having me. Hopefully we can do this again someday. Please, yes, please. <laughs> thank you, dear. Thank you.